Well, thank you so much for, for joining us. I, I gave you a bit of a, a, a warm-up before you came in to talk, and you said you were going to tell us about the journey from employment, uh, sorry, education into employment, and then the young, the, the young at heart on the panel are going to talk much more <laughs> around how business and, ed and employers can do much more around schools. So I'll start with the people who have gone recently into employment, and anyone on the panel of the three of you, if you want to tell us about your journey from education into employment, and what were some of the highs and what were some of the lows about that? I don't know who wants to take that first. Uh, I'll go first. Go ahead, Priel. Um, so hi, everybody. My name is Priel. I'm a degree apprentice at Capstone and I, and I've been there for one, and, one year and a little bit longer than that. Yeah, one year and a bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my journey in Capstone and I was pretty simple. Um, I initially um, applied for some... I initially applied at UCAS for computer science at university. Um, and that's because my sisters, I have four older sisters than me, and they all went to university. So I thought that was the only option um, in my career and in my education. Um, and then Capture and I came to my sixth form. Um, and luckily, it was a time when Christine Hodgson came. Mm. So she is the female chairman of Capture and I. Um, which was really inspiring because I thought that um, there were mainly men in that field. But knowing that there's a female that has such an influential figure in the company, it made me realise um, the, the value that women have in the industry. Um, and that's when I just applied for the degree apprentice and uh, apprenticeship and I just got in. And here I am today. Fantastic. <laughs> well, we deserve a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. I love that. <laughs> and I suppose, Glyn, you're at the same company, yes? Yes. And, but your journey was slightly different. You haven't yeah. got four sisters, have you? What's that, sorry? You haven't got four sisters, have you? <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, no. Just, just, one. Just, just, just one. Just one. So my journey is slightly different. Um, I never went to uni. I didn't actually um, do an apprenticeship. I got onto the apprenticeship scheme. Um, so when I did school, I messed around, did all right. Uh, I did sick form. I did all right, but not good enough grades, and I messed around with my friends. Then the reality of work hit in. Uh, it was tough. It was a, a reality check. So I'd always thought, oh yeah, I'd naturally get a, a career and it would come so easy. But that wasn't the case. So I was doing the day job, day in, day out, and it was very, very frustrating. Uh, that continued. Uh, I've lost my jobs. So I, I used to change jobs in the hopes that actually I could get a career. Um, when I was about 25, I went on to the Princess Trust. From there, I met somebody at Capgemini, um, and he said about, um, would you like to join up with the apprentice scheme? I said, yep, that's fantastic. I applied, and then I got rejected because of the, uh, I failed my A-levels. So that was a, a huge disappointment, but from the work that I did um, within the Printers Trust at the YMCA, mm. um, I got a job there, and then I came back to Capgemini once. I actually uh, was told I was being made redundant. I applied again. They said, okay, we'll, we'll let you in. I was 27 at the time. They'll let me in for the apprentice. I just wanted my foot in the door. I applied, did everything well at my final assessment. Then they said, actually, we think that you shouldn't be doing the, uh, the degree apprenticeship. We'll put you in as an experienced hire on the grad scheme. And just been continuing from then onwards. That's my story. And, and where, what's your job now? What's your role now? So it's a business development uh, consultant. So... Yeah, it's, it's a recent role. Um, I don't know what I'm doing too much, many of the times. <laughs> but it, it's all about uh, just going for it, really. And, uh, you know, you learn on the job. It's just about the right attitude. And I think that I've shown, I might not have a uni degree, but it's the right attitude that has been seen in me that can really take you places. It doesn't matter what's on your, your CV as such. It's the person. Good on you, my friend. Love that. And um, Ryan... Um What's your, your journey from school? Where are you at? Uh, so I'm currently a program manager for a charity called Uprising. Uh, I've been at Uprising almost five years. Um, prior to kind of that, it was quite an unusual journey, I suppose I'd say. Uh, just, I suppose probably the easiest way to keep it brief is to say my ultimate aspiration when I was 16 uh, was I had a girlfriend at the time who had a council flat, and I thought the best thing I can do is get right to buy uh, through with her and to buy that and that was kind of the aspiration I had no particular career aspiration it was all f seen through the lens of that I had a pretty chaotic teen life uh, I'd, I was homeless uh, briefly uh, along with the rest of my family so kind of I was consumed by buying a home and everything else was secondary so I worked at uh, I was at sixth form but I was also kind of working 
uh, I'm kind of trying to take any jobs that I could. Uh, so I worked at McDonald's next. Um, I'd worked at a warehouse, worked at a call center. And it was all really about that. And sixth form was kind of secondary. And then kind of, I suppose, Young Love failed. Um, I found that, you know, I didn't really have anything else going at the time. Uh, so I just went to university because I had slightly better grades than I thought. But I didn't really want to go to university. I was the first person in my family to go to university. Mm -hmm. First person I knew of them teachers to go to university. So it was all a big kind of learning curve. But I changed when I went to university. Um, instead of kind of hanging with the wrong crowd, I decided I was just going to buckle down and really try. So I took the opportunity of getting, I suppose, loans and grants, started taking volunteering apprenticeships, sorry, not apprenticeships, sorry, internships, mm. uh, and really just trying to get the most of that. And then I was fortunate enough, I started Uprising in the January of my final degree year to kind of finish off my dissertation and then just never, <laughs> never went back into exams. And then five years later, I'm kind of where I am now. Good on you, my friend. Um, all of you have had a a very interesting journey to where you are now, but I haven't heard from any of you talk about what the schools did to promote your decisions. Did the schools play any part in where you are now? And, and don't worry, we've got a room full of school people, but don't worry about that. Um, but did, did the schools play anything in, in your decision, Priya? Um, so in my experience, Capstone and I only came to my school because Capstone and I and my sixth form have a really good connection. What's the name of sixth form? Um, Kingsbury High School. Okay. It's the sixth form version of it, though. The high school and the sixth form. Cool. Yeah. Um, so they had a really good connection with each other. So um, Michelle over there. Wait, Michelle. <laughs> hey, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Michelle initially came to um, our school to promote just apprenticeships, just generally, and to show that it is another path that we can take. Um, and then later on, Christine came and showed us that well, you can join Cap Gemini as well. They offer this apprenticeship, and that's how I got to know about it. So if my school and Capgemini and didn't have that connection. I would have never known what degree apprenticeships are. I'd probably be in uni and not enjoying what I'm doing either. Mm, following your sisters, was that the same for you, right, in terms of the support from school? Uh, so my school, and so I stayed at school and went in sixth form, was just focused on university, yep. uh, and particularly Oxbridge. So kind of the only time kind of anyone ever came in, it was Oxford, Cambridge, LSE, occasionally mentioned, it was really about that, and my grades were never anything close to that, mm. so instantly I was not engaged, I kind of wasn't interested. Um, I was always interested in the idea of an apprenticeship, but kind of, I suppose, to give context, it was kind of the, uh, the crash has happened, the only apprenticeships I knew about were those in kind of manual labour, and that's what my family had just been, been made redundant yeah. for, so kind of, I didn't see that as an option, mm. so, but I really wish if I'd known some of the more apprenticeships that were more focused on things that maybe interested me, that probably would have been the route I'd have gone down. And Glim, for you, school wasn't the greatest place anyway, was it? It was, it was a good um, life lesson. So my teachers, um, I can't really remember much of what they actually taught me, but <laughs> in the sense that I can't say that I learned this about Richard III and I learned this about maths and that I can take it and apply it to my job today. But what I did get from my teachers was actually a, a passion for learning and they've taught me to, just through their passion when they're trying to teach me something, that they said, just try to understand why they enjoy it and then I can now appreciate, looking back, why they did that. Um, and it was only like little snippets and just different insights that really made me, looking back, these are lessons that I've actually taken throughout my life. Mm. So I'm going to elevate you, you three now. You, you three are the, you're in charge of education for the government and you've got a room for the teachers around your education policy, what could have been done or what should be done to support the diversity of it? Because you're all very different people. How are we going to get schools to give all of you something that's of value? What, what would, would have worked for you? I think it's about bringing in as many different organisations as you possibly can uh, from as early as possible. So partnerships with external organisations. Yeah, and I mean, and I'm not speaking private sector, but you know, public sector, third sector, kind of just bringing in. I think the big learning for me is that I just, I never had an idea of what possible careers, opportunities, what there were out there. And it's only through meeting people and seeing what roles they do, uh, kind of understanding that, that it was, would have been really useful to have had that as young as possible. And I think that's, you know, kind of things that like Barclays Five skills are great for. Um, but there are also just this bringing in just so many different opportunities. So, because, yeah, there's just there's not that chance. Mm. I think that um, other than bringing in other employers, they should give like opportunities to help the individual um, like flourish in their skills. So I don't know about other sixth forms, but my sixth form has this um, scheme called 
I don't have a scheme name now. <laughs> so it's a, 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 it's a scheme where we teach younger kids how to do sports. Okay. Um, and that scheme really helped me develop my interpersonal skills. Yeah. I mean, like teaching like adults like us and then teaching little kids is such a big contrast. And being able to simplify whatever you're saying for little kids, it can be, different, it can be quite challenging. But I feel like that whole task has helped me explain and vocalise my ideas and my views in the workplace now. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to go keep on going in and out and trying to explain things in a really difficult way. I can yeah. just explain it in a simple way, like how I explain it to the kids. Yeah. So other than just having employers come to the work to um, their sixth form, the sixth form should give them opportunities where they can choose how they want to improve their skills. And maybe once they've learned how to vocalise their views, they can do that with the employer. If they don't have the skills, how are they going to vocalise themselves? Mm. Or how are they going to show their interest to the employer? So you should want to be empowered to understand what's good for you and then be supported in yeah, taking that Yeah, exactly forward. that. Okay. Clear. Um, I would Come on, you've got a big job now, then. Big job. <laughs> um, I'm, I would probably try to help kids to get used to failure. Um, something that's really helped me is just trying and trying and trying again. And it's, it's the way that we perceive the language. We should look at it that failure is actually just part of the path to success. And what is success? There isn't a point when you can just say, this is success anyway. So you should also, as I said, enjoy the journey of that failure. But actually, you're seeing yourself and you're improving. But the, the reason why I say the, about the failure is if you get comfortable in that, you've got more chance of taking risks and just from my perspective, that's actually helped me a whole load in my job right now because there's, there's too many people that are afraid. And if they do come up against something that they, they see in, within their workplace that's, oh, this is too hard for me, they end up quitting. They say, look, I didn't get this promotion. I didn't deserve that. Well, actually, you should look back at it and go, ah, I could do this a little bit better and then prove them wrong rather than just giving up. So it goes back to what Sir Clive Woodward was saying, actually, around that resilience this, that yeah. comes back from... That engagement. And, and Jane, we're definitely going to come to you because you're, as I called you most politely in the green room, you're the schizophrenic <laughs> of the room in terms of being able to see both sides of the, the argument and debate. But Kirsty, it's the point I wanted to, to raise with you. You've heard someone talk about we need to be empowered about more, more skills, more employers need to get engaged with the workforce, and actually you need to teach people that it's okay to fail. How, are, how is the work that you're doing with life skills touching on those three things? Sure, so the work we've been doing at Life School has been doing for the last five years and we've, we're in about 84% of secondary schools and we're trying to really help get young people ready for that world of work. And I think absolutely echoing the young people on the panel is having employers come in, the, the impact for, for young people is far greater and also giving young people that experience of the workplace. Now, I know it's really difficult with a, a, a very packed and squeezed curriculum, but giving young people who might not have those networks around them and inspiration into what else is around them, what else is going on in their local community is really vital. And I think we've seen this with some of the programs we've been running recently um, on the life skills side. It's about thinking about aspirations for young people. It's not always about raising aspirations. Sometimes it's about having realistic aspirations. So a lot of young people we've been working with recently, one particular cohort, all wanted to be footballers. But at the age of 15, I think if they were probably going to be professional footballers, they might have been by then. But by showing them what else is going on in their local community, we've been able to, to broaden their horizons and see some of the employers that are out there by taking them out of the school environment. And that, incidentally, has helped them feel more motivated to study. So there is, when you can link employability back with, to the young people and make it relevant in real-world context, it does actually improve the education attainment that we've found so far. And in terms of what support do you, with the life skills hat on, offer to, to schools around supporting their young people in their decisions? Yeah, so we do. We offer lots of work. So one thing I'm really passionate about is the, as you probably heard a lot today, is how the world of work is changing at, at such rapid pace. And it's almost impossible to predict what future roles are going to be there. But what we do know is there's core transferable skills that young people need. So we talked a lot today about resilience, communication, creativity. These are things that technology can't replace at the moment. So actually, how do we instill those in young, in young people? So we provide lesson plans and workshops for, for schools to use with young people, which is all curriculum linked. So I'm passionate about how you can embed employability in the curriculum. It doesn't need to be a one-off um, careers day throughout mm. the whole year. Mm. It can be embedded throughout the whole curriculum so that young people can really understand what they can bring to the real world when they leave school. And, and Jane, what are some of the, the barriers that you're seeing in that conversation? Because what Kirsty and the young people are saying is that there's a desire from business to want to get involved, and there's a need from the young people so why is it happening all the time? 
I think um, sometimes people make things a little bit more difficult or think or, or perceive them to be more difficult. I, I think the um, links with employers is massive and it really helps. And don't forget, schools are slow burn. Um, you've got young people with you for five years plus sometimes. So you can start to embed those partnerships and work the resilience through your curriculum, through extracurricular activities. And I, I would suggest that if you find a local business to work with, be it a law firm or whatever it is, nurture them, love them, cherish them <laughs> because they're free, they don't cost you anything. And if you do one small activity with them that works really well, then you can say to them, you're sort of like, you know, you, you, you're fishing and then you start to reel them in a little bit. You say, that went so well. Would you like to come back and do you think we should do um, a bit of speed dating? And they'll go, I think we will. That worked so well. Yeah, let's have a go. And then suddenly, before you know it, you've got a partnership that's embedded and it's simple and it's easy and you're working together. You're both being businesslike. And what happens then, you spin off, I'll stop in a minute. <laughs> your spin off then is that your young people are not only linking with employers, but they're engaging in all sorts of different ways and they're building up that resilience. Some of the young people I've worked with who were brand new to the country, for example, and are just emerging with their English language, um, they need to do that pre prep to, to learn skills such as eye contact, handshakes, um, not looking bored when adults are talking. Um, all, all these sorts of things, and that's where businesses can help in small, simple steps. So it, it just reaps endless rewards. Uh, I see often, as uh, in the capacity of, as chair of governors of our school in East London, there are a number of businesses, usually larger businesses, that want to engage with talent earlier in the in the pipeline, so they can expose themselves to the brand, offer something back. Yeah. But that can be really taxing for a school in terms of engaging a whole range of volunteers who want to come en masse to help yeah. and do all yeah. these fantastic activities when we're trying to balance delivering the education and making sure the young yeah. people are out there. How do you advise businesses, and Kosa, you might want to come in on this as well, how do you advise businesses to not scare away head teachers to ad advocate that opportunity that they're actually offering? Well, I think what you have to do is you, you've got this whole menu of employability things that you can do, but you need to personalise them to your school and your community. Then from your list of your menu, you need to prioritise. But where do you start? Because the schools aren't advertising, this is what we need, as it were, so where do they begin? I would contact... Um, I, well, you could start with Barclays. Or, or, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but just there are, everywhere has a local business that would love to come into schools. Uh, obviously, I'm based in Manchester, so I've yeah. got, I, can, I can choose. But even small communities, just get your local opticians in to talk about a, a, a STEM career or to, to do um, a challenge. Mm. Half an hour with 10 kids. Mm. Build your confidence up in the school. Build the business's confidence up. And, and it will go from there. Mm. Just small, simple steps, and it will work. Just before you come in, a show of hands from those in education. Put your hands up if you are engaged with local businesses. Okay, and keep them up if you find that easy. Put them down if you think it's difficult. Okay? In the middle somewhere, okay. <laughs> so, so we've got a bit of a mixed audience there, Kirsty. How do, how, how do you find it engaging with, with education? Because you've got 89% of... 84. 84. 84. I'm, I'm pushing you up, pushing the time. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I think for us, we, we've had a programme that we've really invested hard in to make sure that the quality of the, um, the tools that, that we have for teachers is of high quality. So yeah. I think that, that's helped. We've had, in a fortunate, we've had big marketing campaigns. So teachers can pick and choose how they interact with us. I think for us going in as a, as a business, you know, we found it easier because we've got a big programme. I think for smaller, medium-sized businesses, it's harder. You know, we've got a much bigger a workforce at Barclays and other organisations have. Mm. So we're fortunate from that perspective. But I think, think for small and medium-sized businesses, I think it's about making sure you're really clear in what you want them to do and what you want them to cover um, and being open-minded them, to them to come in. Um, but also, don't be afraid to go out to businesses because I think, actually, businesses get huge benefits from, from interacting with school and young people. Mm -hmm. So not only for the talent pipeline that, that um, Tim just talked about, but actually, in terms of your own skills, so our employers, there's nothing far more daunting, I think, for our employers going and volunteering 
to 14 and 15 year olds. You get very immediate feedback on whether you're a good presenter or not a <laughs> good presenter. It massively helps with your communication skills. And actually, um, sometimes within Barclays, it might be different teams of people who've never worked together before. So actually, as a business, we get a lot back from doing it. It is quite often that the businesses that I speak to won't think that you don't want them, in, you don't necessarily think you want them in there. Yep. So we had one in Berry recently, and the CEO was absolutely amazing. And the kids were like, well, he lives in Berry," And I was like, yes, and look how successful he is. Um, and, he, and I said, how come you've never been into your school? Have you gone back to your local school? He said, oh, no, I didn't think they'd want me. Yeah. So I think, you know, don't be afraid to, to knock on the door for businesses because yeah. most people can see the benefits of doing it. And most people really enjoy doing yeah. it. So our volunteers go time and time again into schools. But just be really clear on what you want to talk to them about. So is it their own career path? Is it mm. a particular technical skill? Just be really clear on, your, on what your ask is. And what are some of the tools that you're, you're seeing land really well with schools? Because you offer a whole breadth of, of, of different tools. So what are some of the things that the teachers are saying, this really works? Yes, I think initially when, when we came up with a programme, I thought the, the tools around sort of CV building, interview techniques would, would be uh, the, the best things. But actually the, the first and most fundamental thing that I hadn't really appreciated is getting young people to understand what skills they have. And I found that the saddest thing when I first went into schools is actually a lot of people, young people, particularly those in more disadvantaged backgrounds, said, I don't have any skills I could offer you as an employer. <laughs> um, and so it's getting young people to understand what skills employers are looking for and then how they can then use them in the working place. So I think that part for me, initially, mm. the programme was, was the most impactful and getting young people to feel they're confident and everyone's got something to co contribute to an employer going forward. I think just to the, the younger people on the panel, um, it's really, uh, I'll, before I do that, there's a quick thing. Me and my son have a little competition because one of your videos you showed with a young man who was using filler words. Yeah. And me and my son now have a competition between us who's going to say the word um, like, or basically, or if. And I thought it would be a fantastic way to get him to really just focus on his, his articulation of language. I now owe him 89 bloody pounds. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I'm well down. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, so, I'll, I'll settle up with you yeah, after. We need to talk about this. But for the younger people on the, on the panel, particularly, I, I think I'll start with you, Priya. There's, there's often a conversation, and I started one of the debates on, on the app, around is there a need to have a discussion about apprenticeships versus going to university to get a degree? You already talk quite clearly about all of your sisters, your four sisters. You've only got one. I know that. I remember that now. <laughs> your four sisters all going to university, and you... Are you the youngest? Yeah, yeah. The youngest going a completely different way. Was that a difficult thing to, to, to overcome? Um, I think being part of a very typical Indian family, it was initially very difficult. And, and explain for those, because I think it's very similar to a Jamaican or an Irish family in <laughs> okay. terms of there's a pathway dictated, is that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the main pathway is just university. <laughs> like literally just university. Anything business related, anything accounting related, anything engineering related, that's for you. That's essentially what most Indian families want their children to have. Um, luckily, I went into technology, so that wasn't too bad. But um, I think explaining, because my parents, they're very, um, they're very used to the idea of university, and they're very like traditional people. So trying to explain to them what apprenticeships were was initially very difficult. I mean, like trying to explain to them that you're earning money whilst you're studying and you're working, they thought that was like, that wasn't real. They just thought it was a dream. <laughs> and literally, they were like, they were asking me every single day, they were asking me, are you sure that you're, you're, you're have, you done, have you actually done your real research or not? Or are you just saying this just because you want to? Are you to really going to get paid? Yeah, yeah, literally. And they used to ask me that every single day. Um, and with the support of my sisters, because they're a lot more educated than my parents are, um, and having the support of them and them helping me explain to my parents what apprenticeships are and what they can actually offer in comparison to university that helped them change their mindset. Mm. And I think only when I started my apprenticeship, that's when they realised how great it was. Even before that, they were still questioning me, mm. even with the support of my sisters. Mm. So um, I think if there are, like, if you do have any young students which do want to do apprenticeships and their parents don't understand it, I think you should just tell them to grab the opportunity. Yes, get the permission of your parents, because we don't want to cause any family drama. No. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but take the opportunity, and your parents will understand the value of it and how beneficial it is once you start doing it. Mm. But Ryan, you were the first to go to university or further education in your family. Yeah, yeah. Um, what gave you the confidence to go that route? Because no one else had done it. You'd never seen it. You had no role models, as it were. Well, it was, it was just survival, uh, basically. Um, as I said, uh, my family had been homeless while I was in sixth form, and kind of that was the only option presented to me due to my grades. I 
I'd, I'd been working in a call centre and been made redundant, mm. uh, so I didn't have a job at the time, and it was kind of literally the following week was results day. Got better results and went, kind of went from there. Um, I wish I could <laughs> tell you no. kind of more, but it was really that. I mean, my, my parents uh, don't have any GCSEs between them, so kind of their attitude towards school is drastically different to say my, my dad, literally my dad, my bro a brother has just started sixth form, um, and my dad is pressuring him to get a job straight away because my dad just does not see the point in sixth form mm. uh, kind of thing. And that's kind of the attitude of my family and I imagine, unfortunately, a lot of young people. Well, I know, Kirsty, you, you talked about the study of the, the underserved uh, young white men, particularly in education, who aren't getting... And you talked about how you could transfer off there. Open to the floor now in terms of any questions that you might have from the panel. I know we've got one just over here. Um, is anyone else allowed to take a couple together? No, go straight to me. I do help um, sort of larger organisations um, find talent, particularly um, uh, what we would deem early careers. And for me, I think uh, what would be um, helpful to, to know and understand more about is um, the actual application process that you have to go through for an apprenticeship and actually being prepared for that because I think an application process or an assessment process for somebody like Cap Gemini would be different for a local employer looking for a, to take on an apprentice. So for me, it was how could how do you feel you could be better prepared uh, for the whole assessment process? Bearing in mind it's probably something you've never done before. Um, I think initially you need to be in close contact with Cap Gemini. Um, so every time Michelle came to our school, we used to always ask her questions regarding the application process, um, and she used to try to give me the best answer that she could. Um, and also, there's so many resources online um, that help you, that assist you and help you understand what the process is like. So on the Capgemini website, they actually have a little journey which tells you the different steps as to what you have to take in order to um, successfully join the apprenticeship. And at each different stage, what I really liked about the application process that Capgemini had was that each, at each stage, if you were to pass, they would give you an email that you passed. I don't think you wouldn't know. But um, if, you, if you didn't pass that stage, then they would give you feedback as to how you can improve when you want to apply the year after. So I think that's something that all employers should have. So it's that process is not like a process that they just take and just for the fun of it. It's a process that's a good learning curve. Whether you actually get it or you don't, you're still learning from it. Okay. Anyone else with any questions? Yes. Hi, I'm Michelle at Cap Gemini. Um, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to kind of reply to the point over there. <laughs> Sorry, I have asthma, so my voice isn't great. But one of the things I think that um, teachers can do is reach out to some of these big employers and actually ask that question. So today, uh, one of my team has uh, 15 young people in the office looking at the degree apprentice program we run, what it means with Aston, how you apply, what we look for, etc. So, you know, if you ask, you may well find that employers already do these things or they will create something for you. And I think the point that um, Jane and Kirsty were making before is really true, is that from the employer's point of view, we get a lot out of this, but we can easily put things in a box and bring them to schools, but really what we want is for you to tell us, I need X. Then we can look at the skills we've got, and Kirsty's lucky in her case, because she's got this amazing program that she can pick and choose from. And with all due respect to Kirsty and her program, she's kind of the top echelon. Most organisations haven't got that. But what they can do is say, ah, you want this, and we can develop this for you, or we did this previously. So they can adapt things, but only when they're asked in quite black and white terms. Otherwise, I hate to say it, but otherwise what happens is we do go all generic on you. This worked at the last school, so you can have one of them. Mm. And that doesn't actually work long term for the employer or for the school. And, and Michelle, from, for your, from your perspective, for the benefit of the people in the audience who would be interested in contacting a big organisation, sometimes that could be quite daunting because who do you contact? Who's the person? Who's the liaison person? Because I'm sure that mm. there isn't many titles, school liaison no, officer no, no. that they can find. So, 
So w what would your advice be to a school who's really keen to do as much for their students as possible, to engage with a business or small business, how do they start that process? Um, well, anybody who's seen me here today can just email <laughs> yeah, me. Obviously you. Perkins <laughs> at capgemini.com. Uh, but how most schools contact us, and I imagine the same happens to Kirsty because her organisation is so well known in this field, is they go on the website, they can't find a name, but they find something like HR at Barclays or HR at Capgemini or recruitment at Capgemini or apprenticeships at Capgemini and they email that and oh God I'm going to say this is going to sound terrible but a decent organisation who does want to work with you and who will work hard to look after students will have a way of dealing with those emails and so they are all sorted we have someone who looks after that and they email us personally and they do actually check that Claire or myself have gone back within a week and replied. Sometimes they do slip through, we'll all put our hands up, and in which case you should email again saying, still waiting, but, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, Kirsty, you can explain it from Barclays, but I would imagine that you get exactly the same emails, you know, HR at Barclays, someone resolves them, send them to someone in your team, and they get a reply within the week. Oh, sorry if I put you on the spot, no, Kirsty. No, <laughs> It can be community investment teams in, in larger organisations. And we get quite a lot of actually of people going from schools going into our local branches and asking them to help out. So, you know, go, think about going to your, your local, if there's big organisations, going to your local offices and asking them what they can offer for schools. And they can always point you in, in the right direction there. Um, for small businesses, it would just be phoning up and seeing, you know, would small businesses may only be a couple of people working there. So I would just phone them up and see if they're interested in doing it. But... Also looking at some of the enterprise advisors, you should all do the careers and enterprise company you heard from Claudia earlier. Look at the enterprise advisors there or your um, local LEP. Mm. Um, or even some great other programs like Speakers for Schools mm. um, that you can look at getting people into. That, that's a website you can go to. Fantastic. Ladies and gentlemen, if you can post that online, we'll definitely follow up. I'll find you myself personally. Um, but ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause to our panel.